No, Adam, thank you for joining us virtually. And thank, thank you so you. much for your thank film. You. Um, just like yeah. you to know that the audience broke into spontaneous applause after your film had just finished. So it's been a real joy to see it on the big screen here. We're very glad to have been able to have it in our program. I, I could actually hear it. The, the connection was open and I could see ah. I could hear the, the end of the film and the, and the applause. So it was, it was almost like being there. Oh, well, not we, really, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but we wish, of course, that you could be here in person. And of I should course. just say to the audience, if you have questions, please wave, and I'll fold them into the conversation. Si tu tens un preferenza para falar en portugués, não é o problema, you pode traduzir para mladen. Também. Um, but to start at the beginning, really, um, I'd just like you to, to start by introducing where the idea for this project came from, I guess. Uh, what first triggered the idea of making a film in Yiwu, and how did that idea turn into the film we've just seen? Uh, well, um, of course, it's one of the most obvious questions when it comes to this film. But uh, um, and the truth is, I was, I was actually looking for a story about China. Uh, even before I heard uh, about you. And then uh, actually a friend of mine, a journalist, Chinese journalist told me about the Christmas production in Evo. And I realized that this is the kind of story that that uh, that could allow me to make uh, the kind of film I want to make. I, I was I was actually looking for a story that would uh, let me avoid the usual usual stereotypes that we that we often see in the in the in the films made by outsiders about China, and uh, and of course I was looking for a story that would uh, 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 that would connect to the Western audiences in a kind of naturalistic manner, with, without too many manipulations. And and uh, when you think about Christmas, Christmas is uh, uh, it's the biggest Western holiday. It's uh, it's the time of the year where we are when we are kind of. Uh, 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 most aware, uh, and when it's the most obvious, uh, our demand for the for the Chinese products, and and but what's most important uh, for me, uh, Christmas is is the biggest family holiday, and this whole sentimentality of of Christmas that we all feel, uh, it kind of helps us put uh, it puts us in the right set of mind to explore these factories uh, not just as places of production but but as as intimate places where uh, best friends are talking about their problems where couples are breaking up and new uh, romantic relationships are, are are forming where parents are pushing their children to go back to school so we're talking about most ordinary everyday lives of the chinese workers and that was my idea to make the film about the everyday lives of the only of the chinese workers in, in what i feel is is a, is a real china a real modern china not the stereotypical picture of china that we usually get Mm -mm -mm. I'm glad you introduced the idea of family actually as well because it was going to be one of my questions too. I think it's there's a cent at the center of the film really are these familial relationships, whether it's kind of family run businesses or the scenes that we see with couples with families and these kind of things. And I'm and I'm interested in this kind of being a mirroring and also your decision to locate the film right there within the family. Um, it comes out very strong that we in essence watch a family drama in some ways with uh, interwoven um, narratives from these different I units. So, um, so I'd be interested to hear you talk a little bit more about that decision to focus on on the family really within this film. But that was uh, I, I set out to make the film about about not just family relationships, but uh, um, it was it was more about actually exploring different generations and different relationships inside of these inside of these uh, factories. These factories feel as as surrogate households uh, in every way. Uh, you would uh, often have the entire families living there. I'm not talking just about small families. I'm talking about large, large families. Uh, grandparents and brothers and sisters with their own families, and often they would come, they would come to these factories from the same remote region of China, and because of course of course China is culturally so diverse and they speak uh, so many dialects, in fact different languages, it makes sense for them to kind of uh, converge to one factory from the same region and usually in these kind of family relationships. But it's not just that new families are being formed in these places, children are growing up, 
uh, uh, these workers live in the in the factory dormitories, not all of them, but most of them that are next to the factories that are part of these factories. So these factories already feel like big households. They feel like like families. And, and if you wanted to make a, a story without uh, a kind of personal agenda, and I didn't have a personal agenda, uh, 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 it's what you get. I mean, this is the story. These are the stories that are unfolding at these places. So it is for them. It is much more about this relationship. Uh, work is there; it's given; it's it's part of their life. But uh, it's much more about that than about Christmas production, about economic relationships, about you know pollution or the or the labor conditions or any of these topics that we usually see in films about China and that that changed a lot uh, in past decade or so, but I, I believe our image kind of remained the same. So for this kind of, I would say, naturalistic filmmaking, this topic was was uh, was um, uh, unavoidable in a way. Mm -hmm. And another thing, these, these characters, um, which of course helps a lot uh, for, for the style of filmmaking, uh, 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 is uh, these characters are kind of stuck in the film set in a way. Because if you think about it, uh, if you're making a film about their everyday lives and then everything they do, uh, and they live in these this setting of Christmas factories, mm -hmm. then their daily routines, their desires, their plans, everything they do, is related to the theme of the film, is the theme of the film. Mm. So uh, all that together kind of gives us the result of, of, of the, as you say, families being kind of in front of the, all other stories and everything is revolving around the family. And of course, family, uh, China is changing a lot, but one of the things that uh, I felt uh, remained the same is, is uh, uh, the family being still at the center of their lives, that this kind of tra traditional family is still there. A family is still at the center of, of, the, of the lives of most Chinese. Mm -hmm. So of course, yeah, these, these, these are reasons enough for, for this kind of storytelling, I think. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, for sure. Does anyone have any questions they want to bring in at this point at all? Then I'd maybe like to continue by also asking about, I mean, we talked a little bit about the factory being a set in some ways, or you were just talking a little about, bit about that. And um, there's also this sense that Yi Wu is this sort of slightly surreal setting for these films, for these intimate lives and dramas to unfold. But at the same time, it feels like there's a second city um, within the film, which is the hometown, which is often referred to by the workers as well. Um, it's sort of the, the invisible second city within the film, um, obviously different to each character. Um, and I guess I wanted to, to broaden up the conversation to think about that. I think it ends up being a, another way in which the film explodes from being this intimate observation of the family unit to really beginning to have these reverberations about migration, globalization, both internal sure. and international globalization. So maybe I'd ask you to, to develop more about kind of this um, surreal juxtaposition of Yi Wu and these intimate dramas, and also the sense of the kind of the, the absent other locations that are mentioned to throughout the film. I think that's uh, in a way crucial for the mood of the entire film. This feeling of melancholy mm. that prevails, it's really there because these, uh, uh, just to give a bit of, of, of a background, uh, of the background, uh, uh, um, there is more than 300 million uh, migrant workers inside of China that move to you know, any region, any more developed uh, industrial region where the salaries are higher and uh, there is more work. And so they're constantly migrating. As I said, many of them are migrating together with their families, but still there is a hometown somewhere. And so these workers, they, they either miss their hometowns or uh, when they go to, home, to their hometowns or if they move to another place, another factory, they would miss their friends or their lovers they left behind in the factories of evil or, or factories of some other town. So this feeling of melancholy is something that struck me really when I was, when I was there. Mm. And, and um, uh, not just the mood of the film, but maybe even my own approach, I, 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 I felt this urge to, to make a very gentle film. And, uh, 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 and, and possibly the main reason is being that because of this feeling that, that they, they constantly miss something. And, uh, um, and of course, uh, if, if, if it, one of the things I discovered in, in China when, when, we, 
when we, when we came there uh, and when I spent some time with these people is that, you know, China, it, it, to me, it doesn't feel like one place, like one country. It's mm. much, it's much more uh, like like when you think about Europe, like 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 a continent. You know, the mm. different parts of China, they, they they really feel like comparing Portugal and and, and Norway or like Sweden mm. and Turkey, and, and so it, it, it's very diverse. So th this migration, it's not just like you know migration inside of one country. Uh, it's these people are 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 constantly confronted with with very different cultures in some of these bigger factories, especially, mm. which uh, gives almost like cosmopolitan feel mm. to places that are at the same time kind of claustrophobic or hermetic. And uh, and so, of, of course, like like any 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 um, any life, their lives are, are very complex and, and their relationships inside of these places are very complex, even though they can feel very, very simple from the outside, you know, the same daily routines, the same people all the time, but it's not, it's constantly moving and it's constantly changing. Mm -hmm. And uh, possibly one of the, uh, uh, possibly the only difficulty I had while making this film in terms of logistics was uh, keeping track of where these characters that I'm following are at the moment. Mm -hmm. It was almost impossible. Some would just disappear, some would go to the hometowns and not return when they said they would return. So because they they never feel like they actually live there, except for a few families with small children that are there because of the school and everything else. Mm -hmm. But they're constantly moving all around. Well, that uh, opens up an organic time to talk about the characters, actually, within the film. Um, from what I understand, there are over 600 uh, factories in Yiwu dedicated to the production of Christmas ornaments. Um, yet your film intimately accompanies a cast of, uh, we have around kind of six different groupings of people. I'd be very interested to, to hear you talking about um, casting, in essence, finding your protagonists um, and working with them throughout the um, film from such a dense and noisy city, as I understand you were to be, um, you've, you've selected your protagonist for this film. And I just wondered what that process was like for you and then what the experience of working with them and accompanying them was like throughout the film. Of course, uh, with this kind of film, we, we had a few more groups of characters that we followed that um, at the end didn't uh, uh, end up in the in the in the in the final film, uh, uh, but in general, uh, again, it was I think quite an organic process. We would uh, we did have some initial research uh, that was done uh, by the production Chinese production company that was facilitating the shoot. So we had the fixers and researchers that would do some initial research, some initial contacts based on my notes, and then they would send me feedback, and then they would receive more notes. So, so I had uh, a base to, to work with when I arrived to China. And uh, But mostly how we found these characters, well, not mostly all of them, is uh, basically by walking around these factories and observing people and uh, 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 some people, some faces were just pop out, some groups of characters. That was one of the very important things. I knew I needed groups of characters or at least couples because uh, I don't have interviews, I don't have voiceovers. So the only way to actually convey what they're thinking about is through dialogue. So some just felt more talkative. Some felt that they are already establishing a kind of relationship uh, with us that of course is very important that I knew will be important eventually when we start filming and uh, then we would start talking to these characters um, I, there was no direct communication between me and uh, between myself and them because I don't speak Chinese but through through a translator who was in fact becoming my assistant director throughout the film because she was um, engaging these characters and getting uh, all the information that I needed that helped kind of decide if they would be if they if we would continue shooting with them and that would be usually the stuff about their background where they come from how did they arrive to Evo. some stories just felt more potent than the others mm -hmm. then of course again about what's happening in their lives right now and what would what will be happening in in the next uh, several months when we planned our shooting so uh, we 
constantly th this wasn't done just uh, in one go we were constantly working like this and kind of uh, planning the shoot and the structure of the film around their own lives and so at the end uh, this kind of filmmaking is uh, more or less uh, fragments of reality fragments of their own lives that kind of fit into the into the structure of the film so I wouldn't say the process was complicated. It was it was just like you know meeting the right people and these right people becoming the characters in the film. Mm -hmm. Does anyone have any questions they want to fold in at this point at all? Then I'd also like to ask you more again about this idea of intimacy and distance at the same time within the film. Um, and again, working with characters and almost simply on a formal level, there are so many beautiful close ups within the film. Um, the camera feels like it's trying to touch its characters a lot. And yet, at the same time, um, you preserve a sense of remove. We always feel like we're watching and outside. And I guess I'd like to talk to you a little more about kind of both that formal approach and working with the cinematographer. It's an incredibly beautiful film. Um, and this sense of negotiating intimacy and distance as a tone and also formally within the film itself. Uh, well, it's exactly what you describe. It's uh, trying to be very intimate with these characters without stepping over some boundaries that I felt should be there because we intruded completely their lives, uh, uh, foreigners. Uh, and uh, I knew I didn't want to disrupt it too much. And, uh, you know, when you think about the form and the style of the film, uh, people usually think about uh, the uh, personal artistic choices or the personal artistic style of the director but very often especially in documentaries but in fiction as well it's a mixture of that and the circumstances and of course the circumstances are like that as you described and as i described in, in more or less the same words uh, uh, these people are working in these factories their uh, um, the, the, the their lives are not as hard as you would usually imagine these are not sweatshops but still life in the factories uh, is hard and uh, I didn't want to be, um, as I said, not just disrupt, but it felt felt wrong to come too close to them. But of course, I needed this kind of sense of intimacy. So for me, uh, again, there was another aspect. Uh, it, it's uh, it's not a digression. It, it's still a part of the same uh, answer. Um, uh, um, because I didn't understand them, I would uh, uh, my translator would would tell me only after the shot was finished what was exactly what they were talking about. Of course, I knew the theme of the dialogue because we would discuss it before we would start shooting, mm -hmm. but. Um, because I didn't know in real time what they're talking about, uh, I I, uh, I could observe their faces, their eyes, and of course you see the changes in emotion, you see the changes in when, when people switch the topics, but in general I was very cautious when to interrupt them, and that was another aspect. I had to let these dialogues go develop for, for, for a long time and kind of naturally fade away, and, and this is how we shot throughout the film. We would find a position that, of course, would give us a, 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 a uh, well, you would say beautiful image, but I, I, I felt like, you know, a right image for, for the scene yeah. that we were shooting. And, uh, but, uh, and the, the scene that, uh, again, the camera that doesn't interrupt them too much, and, and the kind of shot that could hold for a long time. You know, some shots are all right if you want to cut and intercut, uh, and, and uh, I'm not I'm not kind of doing that kind of stuff. So it it would need we needed uh, as you say a beautiful shot that could that could remain there for a long time. And and of course once the dial we would uh, at the end in the editing we would choose you know which part of this shot without too much cutting well without almost no cutting we would choose the right shot based on how the dialogue developed. So it was a very patient kind of. Uh, uh, both patient and 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 an almost fragile process with doing doing it in this way, and uh, but then again with this kind of naturalistic filmmaking you have to be patient. That's the only way to do it. Mm -hmm. And uh, so altogether with my own kind of personal artistic choices and and the circumstances we end, we end up with this kind of film. And uh, another thing, which is all, all, also one of the decisions that was made, uh, one of the decisions that was made in advance was um, using these anamorphic lenses. 
they do add up to the aesthetics and the, and the, 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 the beauty of the shots. But uh, uh, even more than that, they kind of, uh, uh, because the perspective with anamorphic lenses is like that, they give you more of the background. Mm -hmm. So you can approach the characters, but it gives you more of the background. And because I didn't want to go into these, uh, this kind of you know, decorative imagery of shooting, you know, interesting, uh, colorful uh, Christmas decorations while being produced. I was interested only in characters. It was nice to have as much of that background in these mm -hmm. same shots. Mm -hmm. So all these together gave us the, the, the aesthetic of, of the mm -hmm. film. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's super interesting. Anyone want to add in anything at this point? Um, that maybe I'd also like to to think more about, we were beginning to talk about the way the film was edited, I guess, and structured as well. And um, the film opens, of course, in a port, we're looking at the ocean, and towards the end, we go back to that port as well and see the, the items beginning to leave um, the, the nucleus of this film, Yiwu, to the rest of the world. Um, but there's also another moment that, um, is very interesting structurally when towards the end of the film we start we listen to the story of the chinese new year and the dragon and then see a dragon dance um and i'd like to just hear you talking a bit about how you worked upon the structure of the film and the story you wanted to choose tell through that and also this um decision to include the story of the chinese new year as well i find it very elegant within the film and would love to hear you talk more about when that came into the project and what you hope to achieve through it uh, that is one of the hardest questions, uh, 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 the one about Nian and the, and, the, and the Chinese New Year, because uh, uh, I just said before, I, I kind of tried to avoid all the, you know, decorative shots in the film and focus mm. on the characters. And I also uh, wanted, to, wanted to avoid this feeling of um, almost surrealism that usually Westerners immediately kind of read into when you think about you know 600 christmas factories producing mm -hmm. christmas all colorful uh, um, and and uh, basically the, the entire christmas being produced in one place in china uh, I, I felt it would distract from the story that i was trying to tell uh, and the characters uh, that i was trying to 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 describe mm. and so so this this um, there is one scene that kind of uh, doesn't fit this this mindset and it's the scene with uh, with uh, dragon dance and uh, um, my personal reason for that is that um, uh, uh, i kind of felt that it would be interesting to uh, for a moment let go and confront what is chinese tradition and their way of celebrating and kind of uh, confronting that with with this christmas production and what we all know that mm -hmm. christmas is because uh, uh chinese people they don't know what christmas is they don't understand christmas and uh, not because they don't care some don't some do uh, uh it's because it is quite confusing if you think about it uh the whole thing about christmas you have christmas you have jesus you have santa claus it's you know several characters mixing the backgrounds the legends the myths then the whole of eastern europe celebrating basically with the same iconography new years i mean i come from from serbia and it's former yugoslavia and the, the entire eastern europe uh, and uh, and the russia as well i mean we use the santa claus for the for the new year's eve not not, not the christmas so we have this complete chaos i would say and chinese kind of adopted our uh, Christmas and New Year's just for the sake of, of celebrations, but in big cities, in shopping malls, not in the places where these workers come from. But they have their own tradition. And this tradition is, is Chinese New Year and this whole tradition about Nian and the dragon dance and everything. Mm -hmm. So I felt it would be kind of interesting to let in this one scene, their tradition creep into the, the the story about you know how the christmas is made in in, in china mm -hmm. and uh, and uh, i kind of felt that you know the poetic reasoning behind the scene uh, would be enough and that intuitively people would understand what they're talking about and and how and why and of course with this i needed introduction for that and introduction for this kind of scene to, to fit i mean it, it needed to start somewhere was was mother and 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 uh, and um, 
in the sun reading about the legend of, of Nian and discussing different versions of the legend. And, and in this same room where they were reading that on the floor, uh, uh, I actually noticed that under the table, the table was there, uh, there was this same uh, image of the dragon that they're talking about. So it kind of, in these kinds of films, things either fit or not. And this just felt very natural from the story and this mm. and this mosaic on the floor to the to the actual dragon dance in in, in the in the factory itself. And in terms of the structure, uh, uh, in general, we had these characters that we introduced and we uh, um, uh, kind of very quickly uh, got into their lives and the intimate aspects of their lives uh, without without too much introduction, without too much foreplay, we were already there. Mm -hmm. And we stayed with this group of characters not too long. It was you know, sequence for each of them. And then we returned to each of them, uh, to each group. We, we returned uh, not just in form of saying goodbye, but as I said, I had this feeling this had to be a gentle film. And uh, mm -hmm. so maybe even in the form of saying goodbye to each of these characters. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, uh, so after the, after the Dragon Dance, because it is happening in the factory with uh, with the two girls and the family uh, um, talking about you know becoming rich or going back to school and uh, uh, we actually go back to the to the girl and the mother discussing her going back to the school and that's their final scene and uh, actually the film uh, ends with two sisters uh, washing uh, uh, washing the cloths that are dirty from the from the uh, Christmas paints from the mm. paints uh, used for for Christmas decorations. For them, it's uh, it's an ordinary uh, ending of of a day, and um, and they're discussing how hard it is to wash away these paints from the from the cloths. Uh, uh, again, a, a very kind of normal dialogue for them, uh, um, uh, which uh, has. Uh, obvious symbolism in the film itself, but I'm not going to push into that direction. But while they're actually uh, trying to wash away these paints, the, they, they, uh, uh, they um, see the boy swimming in, in the lake and they notice him and they even discuss him in, in one or two lines as saying how tall he is, how much he grew up, meaning that they're there for a while um, in this factory. The, the boy actually managed to grow up while they were there. And uh, after the, the, the final sentence in the film, the final line being said in the film is, I'm tired, mm -hmm. which is what usually comes when you finish your day <laughs> working in the factory the, the entire day. And it's something when you think about the workers, you're thinking about tired people, but not just in China, all around the world. And uh, uh, but and that, after that, we see a boy. We see a boy swimming, swimming um, kind of freely around the, the, the lake. And uh, um, of course, everybody will read whatever they feel right to read into that image. For me, it felt that the life goes on. You know, the life, the life is, the life is still good. The freedom is there, uh, despite all the all the hardships. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. No, I think it's, it works beautifully. And there is also this um, second kind of motif throughout the film that I think adds to the sense of melancholy you were discussing earlier when so much of the dialogue is actually pointing to the future. You no, know, it's kind of about um, going back to school or making plans for the next. Um, and as the film ends, then we're kind of left with this kind of this idea of the future of both their lives and, and ours that unfolds sure. outside of the frame, which I think is incredibly powerful, actually. It's true, because uh, it felt like uh, I'm sorry, I'm hearing myself, so I thought somebody is uh, asking a question. Oh, no, uh, that's great. Go. <laughs> no, I'm sorry. Uh, 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 it's, uh, uh, I was, I kind of lost my uh, chain of thought there. Uh, can you remind me what you yeah, were? Yeah, we were, we were talking about how the film itself keeps pointing to the future, the Which, future yeah. of its characters. Uh, oh, yeah, 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 because it's, it's not directly connected to the film. That's why I, I forgot mm -hmm. for a moment. Uh, I, China feels like that right now. China feels like uh, like uh, like a land of opportunity. China feels like uh, maybe American seventies, uh, but on steroids. It's uh, everybody wants to be entrepreneur in China, and uh, these characters in the film, especially the younger characters. Uh, 
they all have big plans for their lives uh, and they're usually not connected to whatever the traditionally the, it should be not connected to the work in the factory not connected to simply to education they all want to become rich to become free to be in love they, they, it's 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 really the sense that the opportunities are, are, are all around china because china besides being uh, the the biggest uh, manufacturing uh, uh, place in the world the biggest industry in the world it's uh, it's also right now the 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 uh, the biggest market and because it's the biggest market market the the, the 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 opportunities are there the opportunities for the service industry and everything and young people are going into it and so they are all thinking about uh, about the future and there is this again this feeling of melancholy because uh, when young people talk about future it's more like dreaming about future it's uncertain for them and for most of these characters we don't know if they succeeded with their dreams if uh, if they became rich, if they managed to open a, a, a milk tea shop, or you know, or if they returned to the factory, but they are they are dreaming big. And one of the major uh, um, issues with modern China nowadays is it, it actually comes from that because too many young people are dreaming big. Not many of them wants to work in the want to work in the in the factories. And uh, the major problem of modern China is actually the lack of workforce, uh, the shortage of workforce. When we think about China, we think about this immense, uh, immense uh, 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 workforce, cheap labor that is everywhere. But the fact is, it's not there anymore. The major problem of these factory bosses is that they can't find workers, even if they pay them uh, more and more uh, every year. So in most of these factories where the, the life is hard, where the, 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 the environment is not easy and playful, uh, 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 they end up with only old people working there. Young people would work in the factories that are just more pleasant to work in and where they can easily change and go from one place to another because it's, as we said, everybody's migrating and it feels like it's so easy. If you lose one job, you can find another. But yes, you're right. They're all talking about future and they are they are all dreaming big. We haven't got much more time, but maybe I could um, be interested to wrap up the conversation by actually going right back to the beginning. Um, at the beginning of this conversation, you said what motivated this film was really an interest of, of investigating China through the camera, through cinema, through a piece of filmmaking. Um, and I also would be, we also were just talking about you being from Serbia and of course being born in Serbia as the Yugoslav Republic at that point, um, a country which of course was under one party communist rule, I guess, when you were born. And I, yes. and I, and I would just be intrigued to know um, whether that kind of Serbian history inflects or influences um, the way you look at China at all or your motivation to kind of to to make a film there, and also whether you now feel that your Chinese film project is over, or whether you'll be returning with your next with future for future works. I, I'm sure my my <coughs> my growing up influenced it to a certain extent. I'm not sure how much, but I'm sure it did, because uh, I mean I, I was wearing a red scarf, you know, and uh, I was I was a pioneer, you know, the communist pioneer when I was when I was a child. Uh, it quickly faded away, you know, when I was maybe 10 years old, uh, Yugoslavia started falling apart and uh, the communism was quickly uh, um, replaced by, by nationalism all around the country. And uh, so it wasn't there for a long time in my life, but of course it, uh, it I'm sure it not just influenced, but informed my way of looking at, at mm. China. And, and of course, if you think about it, you know, we have we had this um, communist country, Yugoslavia, that from then um, through the period of wars, then a very kind of corrupt transition came to this period that it is right now, and we're still not doing great. And uh, you have a country uh, in Asia, you have China that is uh, that uh, had so many, so much more so uh, difficulties in, 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 the, in the previous decades that, that managed to keep uh, well, at least on surface, this kind of communist rule, and still solve most of its economic and 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 and, and well, some of its economic problems inside of the country. And uh, you know, in in at the end of eighties, um, uh, Yugoslavian GDP was 
20 times bigger than it was in, in, in China. And now Chinese is, I don't know, at least 50% bigger than it is in Yugoslavia. And if you think about it, we're talking about GDP of a country that has almost 2 billion people compared to, to, to 6 million in, in, in Serbia. And uh, another thing, um, uh, I don't know how much it influenced me, but China is kind of in focus in, in Eastern Europe again. Uh, you have all these initiatives that come from China. Um, Serbian citizens, we don't need visas to go to China. We don't even need business visa. Uh, you need a working permit, but if you are going on business for like one or two months, you don't need visa to go there. So that logistically helped, for example, me making this film. Uh, but not just that, many of my friends went to work to China. They went to work you know, looking, um, usually as, as English teachers, they come from all over the Europe going there. And I, I, I actually, even that I saw kind of evolving. At the beginning, they would accept anybody from here to teach uh, English because there is this whole um, concept to edify the, the, the entire nation in foreign languages. And so you need lots of teachers there. But right now, they uh, officially accept only native English teachers. So now they can actually pick and choose and accept you know, people from only a few places in, in the world because you know, the circumstances change. People want to go to, to China and actually they make their more money as English teachers than they would than they would in England. So I'm observing all these things changing and, but you know, with this kind of, these are all kind of, this is a rational answer to your question. I'm not sure if that was the main reason why I went there. I just felt I wanted to make a film about China to explore it. And uh, I, I always enjoyed exploring new places and kind of opening new universes and and and, uh, and making films there, and turning them into the cinematic universes. It was uh, it's 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 an approach I, I have with films, even when I shoot them in Serbia. It's always something that I'm discovering. So I'm I am guided with curiosity, and I was curious about China. Mm -mm -mm -mm. Well, I think we need to wrap up there, but I want to say thank you for your curiosity and thank you for making the film. Um, it's a really delicate and beautiful work and we're very happy to have been able to screen it. So Mladen Kovacevic, thank you so much for your time and your film. Thank you.